Not Taco Bell Material, written by Adam Carolla, presented by the Now Podcast Network. Get your copy of Taco Bell Material by visiting adamcarolla.com. There's the photo on the previous page of the first of many dumps I grew up in. Technically, there were a couple of stops in Philly and New Jersey when I was a baby and a couple months in a rental house in Chadsworth as a toddler. But this is the house I consider my childhood home. The roof was falling off and the porch was falling apart. At some point, my grandfather decided to rebuild the front porch. But in the Pennywise pound foolish Corolla tradition, he bought used lumber that had been salvaged from a pier fire. The boards were warped, charred, and had termite damage. That porch stayed up for 15 years. It was humiliating living in this place. It was called the barn by the neighbor kids. It had one bathroom, no dishwasher, no air conditioning, one washing machine, but no dryer, yet it had two front doors. Two doors right next to each other at 90 degrees. I never thought it was strange until I dug up the picture below some years later. There is a symbolism to it. It made no sense. It didn't conform to any standards, yet was acceptable as if it was completely normal and didn't need fixed, just like my family. My dad is the white guy in the Dashinki who looks like the lead singer from Boston. My parents had just gotten divorced and my dad was ready to swing. It was time to put on the medallion and hit the disco. My mom is the one in the back looking like a depressed lesbian Mo Howard. Next to her hiding from the world is my older sister and only sibling Lauren. That's me second from the left standing next to my grandfather my step-grandfather, Lonzo Gorig, the only sane person in the clan. More on him later. My grandmother is behind the camera. I could fill the rest of this book with details about the other dead-eyed people in this picture, but I won't. What I want you to notice is that these are the expressions that they have when the picture is being taken. Imagine the complete lack of joy being expressed when the camera is put away. That's what I grew up in. My mom was a full-blown hippie. Everyone thinks a hippie is a free love and tambourines, but my mom was the paranoid bummer version of hippie. There was a constant hand-wringing and worry about the atomic bomb, the ozone layer, pollutions in the streams, and how we're oppressing indigenous peoples. Her message was basically, Good luck enjoying your childhood while other people starve. The planet goes to shit. And we nuke each other. And it's all our fault because we're evil, greedy white people. Being a depressed hippie is a lose-lose. It would be like if a rice cake had the calorie content of a moon pie. My mom hung out with some world-class long hairs. She had a friend named Happy one named Sunshine, another named Axis, and one guy named Zorback. His name was probably Gerald, but he went by Zorback as a fuck you to the man. Take that, Nixon. I'm not sure if they were dating, and I don't want to know. But he was one of those guys that was always hanging around after my folks split up. Zorback drove a customized microbus. It was essentially a mobile raping unit. The streets in San Fernando Valley in the early 70s were filled with custom vans, three-wheeled Harley choppers, army jeeps, Baja bugs, and sand rails, everything except normal cars. Picture the bad guys from the Road Warrior, minus the super homoneurotic overtones. One time, when I was 11, Mom, Zorback, and I pulled in to the back mobile to go camping. I was sitting next to the rear window, which was fastened out of an old screen door. This created a vacuum 
that sucked all the exhaust into the back of the bus. I thought I was just falling asleep, but later I figured out that I had gotten carbon monoxide poisoning. Thank God the adult supervision was baked and decided to stop for the munchies and left me in the back. Parents, I know what you're thinking. They just left him alone? But you have to remember, it was a different time. If your kid was asleep in the car, you wouldn't wake him up unless you needed him to go into the liquor store to get you a pack of smokes. I woke up, left the bus, and wandered around the grocery store. I grabbed a can of Coke that I wanted them to buy for me, but I kept dropping it. I was so loopy from the carbon monoxide, everything was dark and echoey, and I couldn't even get my feet under me. I stumbled into the bathroom and thought it would be a good idea to take a nap on the cool tile floor. Eventually, an employee came in and told me to move along. To add to my tripped out confusion, a woman came up to me, handed me a pack of beef jerky, and asked me to open it for her. How often does that happen? Some stranger coming up to you in the store and asking you to open a big bag of jerky for them. Yet it happens to me when I'm 11 and fucked up on carbon monoxide poisoning. I was wrestling with it like an alligator. I don't know if I ever got it open. I staggered out of the place and back to the bus and became more coherent as the minutes wore on. But I was nauseous and had a headache and was fucked up for the next 48 hours. Eventually mom and Zorbak figured it out. I had carbon monoxide poisoning and attempted to remedy it by sitting me next to a campfire and bathing me in secondhand pot smoke. I know that this had to cause me some brain damage. I'm convinced if it hadn't happened, I would have went to college, grad school, and eventually created Facebook. Nice going, Zorbak. Everything in the house was second-handed. If there was such a thing as a third-handed, the Corollas would have jumped in on that train. It wasn't just furniture and retreads on the car. It was intimate items, pillows, blankets, coffee mugs, tampons, maxi pads. My sister's favorite drinking glass was a graduate cylinder from the turn of the century that looked like it was part of an old-timey chemistry set. We later found out it was a jar for urine specimens. Like any descent hippie, my mom shunned material possessions and waste and the consumer society and blah blah blah. Some families have lasagna night and family board game night. For the Corollas, Thursday night was trash picking night. Mom, sis, our neighbors, the Gravitches, and myself would scour the neighborhood in search of stuff we wouldn't throw away. You've heard of the old oddage, that one man's trash is another man's treasure. Unfortunately, I was raised by the second guy. So my idea of a good weekend growing up was to head to Schwinn, the shop where I could dumpster dive. If I was lucky, I might find some handlebars that were bent because the previous owner was unlucky and got hit by a truck. My family was cheap and poor, but they were also honest. Maybe a little too honest. A lot of kids, especially not a ways, were raised to go without and get yours. Or screw him before he screws you mentality. My family's battle cry was, what about the other guy? All the other people. Especially if their skin was darker than mine. They were to come first. Here's a little story that predates this house, but perfectly illustrates this line of thinking. I was about five years old and living in Cherry Hill, New Jersey. I was at the Cherry Hill Mall with my mother and I found a $50 bill. Not a wallet with a 50 in it, just a loose, crumpled up bill. I used to find a lot of shit when I was a kid, but I just recently realized 
it was because I was only two feet off the ground. Sadly, my five-year-old twins never find anything on the ground because they're too busy staring up at the 42-inch flat screen mounted on the wall in their room. Anyway, I showed my mom what I picked up and she told me we had to go to the lost and found and report it missing. Even at five years old, I was thinking, bitch, are you nuts? The guy at the lost and found is just going to pocket it. I should have grabbed a bar stole and climbed up and slapped some sense into her. When we brought it to the desk, the guy said, We'll keep it for two weeks. If no one claims it, it's yours. I was at my house waiting impatiently for two weeks to expire like a prison convict scratching lines into his cell wall. You have to remember, this was 50 bucks in 1970. At the time, gas was 22 cents a gallon and we were Corollas. I didn't even know $50 bills existed. I thought they stopped at 10. The bounty was claimed to my mom's self-hating white delight by a heavy-set woman of color. To the woman's credit, she found out that I had returned the bill and came to our house to give me a reward, 10 bucks. Then for some reason, my mom made me split it with my sister. My $50 cash got whittled down to $5 and a hug from Nell Carter. The perfect storm meets atheist with an unhealthy dose of what's in it for me formed the holy trinity of pathetic Corolla Christmases. One of the most memorable holidays was the year my mom cut down a branch from a pine tree and leaned it against our living room wall. That's a step down from Charlie Brown. Christmas at my grandmother's house was even worse. She never purchased a tree, opting instead to decorate the potted rubber tree plant that was in her living room. She just threw a little tinsel on the house plant and called it a holiday. Two of the people in the photo at the beginning of this chapter are my uncle and step aunt. They were named Gombi and Bushi. They were from Hungary. We used to spend Christmas Eve over at their house. This provided the setting for the only Christmas tradition we had. The family grab bag. Imagine this scene. All the grown-ups would bring a gift costing no more than five dollars. The gifts would get wrapped up and piled up in the corner. Everyone would get in a circle and draw numbers. And when their turn came up, they grabbed a random gift. One year my dad drew his number, took his turn at the grab bag, and got a gift fit for a king, a shrimp de-vainer. It was a little plastic shrimp on a weird hook thing used to pull the veins out of a shrimp. It could not have cost more than a buck twenty-nine and was definitely purchased at the grocery store on the way to the party. That's if it was purchased at all. It might have been stolen from an all-you-can-eat seafood joint. What is for sure is that there was zero thought put into it. A moment of contemplation is all it would have taken to realize that no one in my family could afford shrimp. Shrimp were far too expensive and delicious to grace the Corolla dinner table. A fucking shrimp de-vainer! If someone would have given that to me today as a gift, I would dive across the table and stab them in the neck with it. In my family, the cheap jab was always followed by the haymaker of laziness to deliver the knockout blow. Average garden variety laziness might prevent someone from accomplishing a goal for a couple of months, but in an ironic twist, the Corollas really stepped it up when it came to not stepping up. I'll give you two examples, both over 40 years in the making and in keeping it with the holiday theme. The first one takes place on Thanksgiving. My grandmother's house had a piano. I know that sounds upscale, but like my grandmother, it was weathered, old, and barely upright. Before I was born, some roofing tar dripped onto its arm. 
Think wax droppings from the world's shittiest candle. And there it stayed until I grew up. We were at my sister's house six years ago for Turkey Day. My grandfather had died and my grandmother was fading fast. So the piano had made it to her house. I was sitting there eating my stuffing and cranberry sauce when I glanced over at the piano and noticed something. The tar. The goddamn tar was still there. I asked why it hadn't been removed. Not one family member could give me an adequate answer. It wasn't like they tried. Nope. No one had bothered. But I was bothered, so I got up, walked to the kitchen, grabbed a butter knife, and easily plopped off the tar. I did it in one single motion, what my whole family couldn't, and more importantly, didn't attempt to pull off in my entire lifespan leading up to that moment. The second incident occurred just last year when I went to visit my mother. I hadn't been inside the house in quite a while and poked my head into my stepfather's room, which was also our den. My mom and stepdad slept in separate rooms. Don't ask. I looked up towards the ceiling and saw something very pathetic and telling. In 1973, my cousin Greg was visiting and we were eating fruit roll-ups, the cheap, generic precursor to the fruit roll-up. We were fucking around and decided to see if we could stick a piece of fruit roll to the ceiling. This was an old colonial house from the 1880s, and for some reason back then, they built houses with super high ceilings. Which is ironic since the average height at the time was 5 foot 6. Most ceilings now are down to 8 feet while we're all getting taller. At this rate, my grandkids are going to be brain damaged from the ceiling fan. But what makes it even nuttier is that the footprint of the room is 7 by 9. My stepfather's room slash den was built in a shoebox standing on its end. Despite this, we managed to pull it off. And 39 years later, that quarter-sized piece of jelly flypaper was still affixed to the ceiling. My stepfather has been in that room staring at that ceiling as he drifts off to sleep with visions of strawberry fruit roll-ups dancing in his head for 40 years. Now that is officially a Corolla. Final thought on how lazy my family is. I don't even have a middle name. There is a blank spot on my birth certificate where the middle name should go. Somewhere in the mid 80s I was renewing my license and the middle name spot was blank, mocking me. Thus, Adam Lakers Corolla was born. About six years ago, I asked my dad why I don't have a middle name. He gave me the worst answer a father could give a son. He thought about it, scratched the back of his neck, and said, I don't know. He followed up with, Ask your mom. When I asked my mom, she gave me the worst answer a mother could give a son. Did you ask your dad? I'm more offended at the lack of excuse than the lack of a middle name. It wasn't like you were born premature in the back of a cab and we didn't have time to fill out the paperwork. Nope. Just, eh. And here's the worst part. My dad's dad's name was Giacomo. I could have been Ace Giacomo Corolla. It's such bullshit. You'll read more, much, much more, about my friends Ray and Chris in future chapters. But I thought it was worth pointing out that it was at this stage of my life I meant the two guys who would become my best friends and occasionally my worst enemies. I met Ray at Colfax Elementary and Chris while playing pro Warner football. I start on the farm team, then move up to the Gremlins, then two years of Mighty Mites, Pee Wee, Midget, then Bantam. My hippie mom hated that I played pro Warner. 
The only thing she liked about it was that it exposed me to people of color so I could learn firsthand how horrible white people are. As I said, race was an issue for my mom. She was a Chicano studies major at Valley's Junior College despite being slightly whiter than Tom Petty. Really. That was an actual major. We didn't watch a lot of TV when I was a kid, but we did see every second of Roots. My mom sat there staring at it with a disgusted look on her face, and then every 10 seconds she'd look at us and say, Do you see how bad we are? Do you see what we did? I was thinking, I'm 12. What the fuck did I do? Throughout this book, I won't be able to stop myself from going off on a few tangents. These will be signaled by this daper fellow. A tan gen. Get it? I've spent the better part of my life in a society that's trying to make me feel guilty for a crime I did not commit. My dad's family was in Italy during the time of slavery. And forget about owning people. Those losers would be lucky if they owned a donkey. Once on Loveline, when I was trying to plead my case about the Corollas and slavery, I made the mistake of using my sister's children as an example. They're not black. They're the opposite. They're German, I said. The kids were born in Germany. Their father is full-blooded German and they arrived on this planet a lot closer to the Holocaust than I did to slavery. Does that mean they should be held responsible for the Holocaust or bear the guilt associated with it? Of course that would be an insane notion, but somehow the same math doesn't apply to many Americans when it comes to slavery. On a happy note, some cunt my sister carpools with told her that I called her kids Nazis. Side note to my side note, I'd like to address this to the people who feel the need to pass along hurtful information, especially when they have to bamboozle it with bullshit. You should kill yourselves. Please kill yourselves. You're driving me fucking crazy. It's profoundly disappointing to me that people feel the need to invent facts or bolster their incorrect arguments. Your motives are worse than a serial killer's. You're going out of your way to hurt someone, but you stand to gain nothing from it. At least the serial killer gets to go home and beat off. But back to my mom. When I was nine or ten, she used to ship me off to hang with the Boyd brothers, black twins who were on my Pop Warner team. Henry and James Boyd lived in the ghetto on the edge of Los Angeles called Paca Mia. I was the only white guy amid a sea of black faces. Their dad wasn't around, their older brother was in trouble with the law, and mama was morbidly obese. We used to eat grits and collard greens. Think Steve Martin's family from The Jerk. One semi-awkward moment came when I was spending one of my many weekends there and we were playing a game of football on the front lawn. At this point in my development, I couldn't be tackled by someone my own age. I had supernatural balance. Even the Boyds couldn't take me down. I got the ball, did a little shake on Henry and a little break on James and scored a touchdown and I followed it up with a hearty, how do you like me now, nigger? Before you could call Al Sharpton. You have to remember a couple of things. This was the mid-70s, the height of Richard Pryor's fame. That word was used liberally at the time, especially by the Boyd brothers. I didn't even realize I was doing it. I was just fitting in. They had been saying it all day. And more important, they weren't offended. In fact, they were kind of impressed. It was like that scene in Goodfellas 
where Spider tells Tommy, go fuck yourself, and everyone's proud of him. Of course, Spider ends up getting shot in the chest seconds later. But Pop Warner was the most important thing in my childhood. I think everything that's wrong with our kids today could be corrected with just a few seasons of Pop Warner. Teamwork, discipline, and most important, a fat guy and a maroon windbreaker screaming at you. Dig this notion for just a minute. I played seven years of Pop Warner football, ages 7 to 14. I played offensive tackle or guard every single one of those seven years. I never scored a touchdown or even touched the football. All I did was block for the guys who did get to do that. And I liked it. It felt good to be lying on the ground and look up to see a guy run through the hole I just opened. I can't imagine your average nine-year-old feeling that way today. But my mom just saw it as violence and completely ignored the self-sacrifice, drive, and discipline it taught me. She didn't have enough energy to stop me from playing, so she adopted basically the same stance as a Buddhist would have with the Vietnam War. To put it another way, Ariana Huffington has more interest in tractor poles than my mom has in football. In 10 years of football and 6 years of baseball, I accumulated a closet full of participation trophies. None of them means as much to me as a little cup the size of a soft-boiled egg holder on a piece of imitation marble with a plaque that didn't contain my name. It was awarded to me by the opposing team at the 50-yard line following the bowl game and simply said, Best Defensive Player. The fact that the group of athletes we just finished competing against decided that I was the best on the defensive side of the ball means more than any participation trophy ever could. The criteria for a trophy should be more than being born and having a mom who owns a minivan. Without distinction in achievement, it's not worth the plastic it's molded out of. The handful of brave souls who attempted to take out German pillowcases on Omaha Beach weren't lumped in with the guys stateside setting up folding chairs for the USO show. In the past, we've never confused stepping up with showing up. Now, if you'll excuse me, I have to present my son with a plaque for making a solid BM. The following story demonstrates how nuts I was about football. In my fourth season, I suffered a freak injury. I broke and dislocated my right shoulder during the game. The injury was so severe that they called an early halftime and let me lie there in the middle of the field until an ambulance arrived. I don't think the dads were up to moving a kid with his shoulder dangling out of its socket. So we just sat there and waited. The separation was so bad my shoulder was out of its socket for the following four days. That's got to be some kind of record. How was my shoulder out of its socket for four days? Day one. Took an ambulance to the emergency room, shot my shoulder up with God knows what. And the poor ER doctor tried to pull it back into place. It didn't go. And you only get one attempt because the screaming and writhing in pain is too much for a second round. Day two, went to the orthopedic specialist. He shot it up with something and he got one try. Day three, checked into the hospital and waited for day four. Morning of the day four, I was put under general anesthesia and that's when they were able to put my shoulder back where it belonged. Now how does this illustrate my resolve when it comes to Pee Wee football? The next year rolled around and I was excited for my fifth season. My parents only took one stand that I can recall. They were separated and didn't agree on anything. But on this topic, they were on a united front. No more football. My injury from the prior year before 
had been so severe that the doctor said my arm might not grow correctly. The orthopedic surgeon wanted to put a permanent pin in my shoulder. My mom fought against it and I ended up with a cast for three months instead. Either way, if my shoulder was injured again, it would have been catastrophic. I told my parents I was playing and that was it. The only upside to having a family that took a lazier The only upside to having a family that took a laissez-faire approach to rearing was that you could call the shots. Them not saving for college or preparing meals was the downside. They, in an uncharacteristic burning of calories, said, absolutely not. I said, either I play football or you don't have a son. I proceeded not to talk to them for more than two weeks although I'm not sure if my dad noticed. Finally, they gave up and said, go ahead. I played six more years, including high school, and a year of college, and never injured that shoulder again. When I think back on the experience, I now realize that my motivation wasn't so much a love of football, but a hatred of my life off the field. My freak shoulder injury sidelined my first love of football, and was about to sideline my second love, riding unicycle. Contrary to popular belief, Julianne Hugh didn't teach me to ride the unicycle in my early 40s. I, in fact, mastered that discipline by my 10th birthday. My dad was dating a woman whose son had a unicycle. One day, when he went to her house on the west side, I decided to spend several hours teaching myself to ride it. I went into the street, propped myself up against a car fender, and refused to quit until I could take five pedals away from the Pontiac. The first time I did it, I felt transcendent. That night on the ride home, I could think and talk about nothing else but how I was going to get my hands on a unicycle. My family was the opposite of a Make-A-Wish foundation. They took able-bodied kids and did nothing for them. This was pre-eBay, pre-Craigslist, and North Hollywood wasn't exactly Saratoga, Florida. Headquarters of the Ringling Brothers. And then it hit me. Dave Lewis, sons of the Munsters, Grandpa Al Lewis, an older brother of my former best friend Teddy Lewis, had a unicycle, albeit covered in rust and duct tape in his backyard, he was willing to part with it for $10. I washed a bunch of cars at my dad's apartment building that weekend, and the next thing you know, that unicycle was tucked neatly between my ball sack and asshole. I polished the chrome with a Brillo pad, oiled the only moving part that it had, and even sewed a denim seat cover from the part of cutoffs they never talk about. In a few days I was getting on and off it without the aid of a car fender. Within a few weeks I was riding off of curbs, park benches, and by the end of the year I was dropping off of picnic tables and riding away. Even the huge cast on my right arm from shattering my shoulder didn't slow me down. Unfortunately, a kid with a broken arm on a unicycle was a rolling billboard for my mom's don't ask, don't tell parenting approach. She put her Birkin stone down and said no unicycle. Since my unicycle license had been revoked, my friend Chris Shampman decided that as long as it was going to be gathering dust, I should let him borrow it. I did, and it was a mistake. When my cast came off, I asked for my unicycle back. Chris said that he had returned it to my backyard and that if it wasn't there, someone must have stolen it. Chris's mother immediately snapped into action by doing nothing. This led to a standoff. She was too busy creating a self-entitled monster to make him return something that wasn't his. And my mom was too apathetic to go and demand back something that was stolen from her kid. It was like Ali Frazier, two great warriors, 
going at it. Well, that's that. Ultimately, my mom retained her belt when Chris's mom did not return my unicycle. I'll never know for sure if Chris put the unicycle in the backyard or not. He died at 25 from what most people think was AIDS. His older brother, Jesse, had already died at 19 in a car accident. My guess is his mom doesn't think about the unicycle nearly as much as I do. Though most of my life, I had a large unicycle shaped hole in my soul. It wasn't until my early 30s that I finally got my next unicycle. I went out, bought myself one, and got back on it. Riding a unicycle is just like riding a half bicycle. You never forget. My point is this. You can see that my life did not start off well for me. And for a lot of you reading this, it didn't start off well either. But that doesn't mean it's too late to go out and get back in the saddle of your proverbial unicycle. That said, I had several more years of purgatory to wade through before I could ever consider achieving my dreams. My dad had just closed escrow on a $15,000 A-frame with a dirt driveway, so it was backward and downward. Eventually, Mom and Zorbach figured it out. I had carbon monoxide poisoning and attempted to remedy it by setting me next to a campfire. <laughs> <laughs>